Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we're doing a tutorial on liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. And the reason why? Well, the hydrogen engine is just better than every other rocket type. Unfortunately, it takes liquid hydrogen. And since you're going to go through the process of making liquid hydrogen, you might as well go through the process of making liquid oxygen. These two rockets have almost identical feature sets. They both have four solar panel modules, they both have a trailblazer module and a battery. You'll notice though, the liquid oxidizer tank is much smaller than the solid oxidizer tank. And this is great. Not only that, liquid oxygen is a much more effective oxidizer as well and requires only one fourth of the fuel to oxidizer ratio. That is a one to two ratio. In other words, for every 900 kilos of petroleum, you would need 450 kilos of oxalite. We'll be able to run both large liquid fuel tanks full of liquid hydrogen with only this one small liquid oxidizer tank. That's how effective liquid oxygen is as an oxidizer. But additionally, it also frees up space on the height. You'll notice that both the petroleum engine and the hydrogen engine have the 35 tile height maximum. But that's about it when it comes to similarities. The hydrogen engine has a much higher rocket speed, and this is due to the module engine power of 55. Whereas we look over here on the petroleum engine, the module engine power is only 48. What this means is you can be heavier with the hydrogen engine and go faster than what the petroleum engine is able to do. You'll also notice that the hydrogen engine has a built-in artifact transport module. Very handy. Also, if we take a look at our rocketry chart, we can see that it takes much less fuel to run a hydrogen engine as it does a petroleum engine. With a petroleum engine clocking in at 90 kilos of fuel per hex, with the hydrogen engine coming in at 56.3 kilos. What this means, with 1800 kilos of liquid hydrogen, we're going to be able to travel almost 32 tiles. It's much better than when running two large fuel tanks for the petroleum engine, we're only able to get a maximum of 20 tiles. And finally, while you're in flight, the hydrogen engine can provide 600 watts to your rocket's interior, where the petroleum engine can only provide 480. So there's our reasoning. Now in my current Let's Play series, I'm probably going to still keep a bunch of petroleum engines around. Quite frankly, because we have the infrastructure already around to support them, and we don't necessarily need every single engine to be able to go 35 tiles away. Now the first thing you want to consider when building liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen is positioning of your site. And the reason why is because you don't want to be transporting liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen all over the map. Because it has such a small temperature threshold to maintain that liquid state, you want to build it relatively close to your hydrogen engine. That way when you're filling these tanks, or filling the oxidizer tank, your pipe runs don't have to be too far. For that purpose, I think we're going to build it right about here. So where are we getting our source of hydrogen and oxygen? Well, it's actually pretty easy when you use the electrolyzer. Remember, the electrolyzer takes water and produces oxygen and hydrogen. Now, to be fair, it produces a lot more oxygen than it does hydrogen at a ratio of about 8 to 1. But that's okay. Because in this instance, we're only going to be running one hydrogen rocket. But you can easily add multiple electrolyzers to the setup to get more hydrogen. For instance, this setup here. We have four electrolyzers producing all of our oxygen for our colony. What's even better is it produces enough hydrogen to be able to power itself. In this case, we don't want to use that hydrogen to power itself though. We're actually going to self-power it and be able to get every drop of hydrogen out of this system. So we can actually start with this as a blueprint. So we're going to duplicate what we had down there and start with our six gas pumps. This is going to be able to provide all of our oxygen to the liquid oxygen side of our setup. A quick note, you'll notice I don't have any ladders. And that's because I have jet suits at the ready. Now, the jet suits are going to be pretty convenient for to be able to build everything up without having to build a bunch of scaffolding. There is going to be a disadvantage, though. At some point, we're going to have a vacuumed area. We don't want the jet suits to be flying in and out of our vacuumed area because, well, quite frankly, it'll fill the area with carbon dioxide. So as the dupes get started with this, let me build out the rest of the framework for our hydrogen and oxygen production. This is a good start to give our dupes plenty to do. 
Now, because we're building this in the vacuum of space, we're not going to have to siphon out any gases, but we do need to make sure that we have background to make sure the gases that we do produce will stick. And for that reason, we're going to use drywall. You can use almost any material as long as it can deal with the temperature. And most materials can. In this case, we're going to use granite because we have plenty of it. Now, if you've never seen an oxygen center, or a full Rodriguez in this case, be built, we're going to go into some of the details here. But I have plenty of videos about the in-depth building of this specific device before we actually get to the device that's going to deal with our liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen production. But we need this to be able to supply the materials. Now, once the duplicates are finished building all of this, we'll go over this in a little bit more detail, but long story short, it's providing hydrogen and oxygen. That's it. The real meat and potatoes of what we're really getting at today is going to be up here. This is where we're going to be turning that gas form hydrogen into liquid hydrogen and the gas form of oxygen into liquid oxygen. We're about far enough along with our hydrogen and oxygen production half of the project, so I wanted to kind of break it down in case you had not seen one of these work before. Again, this is just the meat and potatoes behind the full Rodriguez. But in the slim chance you haven't seen one of these, it's a pretty simple process. We're going to bring fresh, clean water in through the electrolyzers. The electrolyzers are then going to do what they do best and produce oxygen and hydrogen. The hydrogen will float to the top and the oxygen sinks to the bottom. Now these pumps are controlled by Atmo sensors. Once there's enough atmosphere, this gas pump will take the hydrogen and pump it somewhere. And the same goes down here, except these six gas pumps are going to be pumping the oxygen. We have a couple of large power transformers separated into two legs. One is powering two electrolyzers, three gas pumps on the oxygen side, and then one gas pump on the hydrogen side. And then the second leg is just powering three gas pumps and two electrolyzers. Now there's a couple of differences between using one of these setups for oxygen to breathe versus oxygen we want to super cool and basically it comes down to flow. We only have two of the gas pumps right now connected into the gas vent up here. The other two pairs are actually just venting into space because with this sort of setup you actually want to continuously use that oxygen because if you're not getting rid of the oxygen pressure down here there's no reason to create hydrogen. So in order to make this thing run full bore, we dump the excess oxygen into the vacuum of space. But here's where all the magic happens. And I don't want to go into too much detail how this works until we get further along. But all you need to know right now is all the oxygen will be heading into here and all the hydrogen will be heading into here. We've made a lot of headway and we're just about at the point where we can start filling this thing up with liquids and gases and seeing what happens. First, let's talk about the science of how this works. We know we need liquid hydrogen, and this is actually probably one of the more difficult things to accomplish in the game. And the reason why is because you have to get hydrogen gas colder than minus 252.2 in order for it to liquefy. And because of the way the simulation works, it's actually got to be a little colder than that to make sure that you can maintain it. So for argument's sake, let's say minus 254 or minus 255. The difficulty comes into play because the threshold between hydrogen as a liquid and hydrogen as a solid is very small. Your beautiful fresh hydrogen liquid will actually turn into a solid at minus 259. So that's a very small margin of error for us to work in. It's much different for oxygen. Oxygen, the gas, turns into a liquid at minus 183. What's even better is we don't have to worry about it turning into a solid until minus 218. So it's a much bigger margin of error for us there. And because we have to make those gases so cold, you're going to have to have super coolant. There's just no other way to get to those type of temperatures maintainably without super coolant. If we go over to our super coolant, we're reminded that it also will turn into a solid at minus 271.2. Except you can't really do that in the simulation. When we put the super coolant through this thermo aqua tuner, we're just going to set it to the max. And you'll be able to see... It's at minus 271.2. The thermo aqua tuner won't make it any colder than that. But remember, just because we can get that cold doesn't mean we want to. We want to target around minus 256. So we're going to set this thermo aqua tuner at minus 256. Now remember, we have a lot more playroom with our oxygen, so we're just going to say minus 200. 
That'll give us a good enough temperature to make sure it's all nice and liquid without coming too close to its solidification point. Now that we've talked about those temperature thresholds, how does it really work? That's actually pretty simple. All we're doing with this thermo aqua tuner is running super coolant through these little areas over and over again until this entire room becomes minus 256 degrees. Same thing for this room at minus 200. And all the gas in here will then liquefy. Now I'm gonna show you the plumbing overlay, but it's okay, we're gonna get through it. Yeah, I know. The reason why the plumbing overlay looks so bad is because not only do we have to pump the liquid out, but you don't want the liquid sitting static inside these pipes. That's why once we send the liquid out and it fills up the tanks, anything extra comes right back into the room through this liquid vent. We'll highlight that a little bit later once we get the whole thing up and running. The other pieces of automation in each room, which you'll notice they're pretty much mirrored from oxygen to hydrogen side, is we have a hydro sensor that controls this liquid pump, and that way we can control when the liquid pump is allowed to pump. In this case, we're gonna say, don't pump until you have at least 750 kilos. And then the same on this side. What this does for us is it allows the liquid to fill up in the tank, and that way you have a resting amount of liquid before the pump starts pumping it away. Otherwise, as soon as some of the gas flashes to a liquid, the pump would pump it out, and then you'd lose that good thermal mass. This hydro sensor is connected to these gas vents, and its job is to make sure that we don't over flood the room by continuously injecting more hydrogen or more oxygen. For these guys, we're gonna say, send a green signal as long as it's under 900 kilos. And all that means is the liquid will fill all the way up to this point up until it gets to these tiles. When it has more than 900 kilos, it'll shut this vent. Basically saying, hey, we have enough liquid hydrogen or we have enough liquid oxygen, stop sending me the gas. A little bit more cleanup to do, but once we're finished with that, I think we're ready to seal this thing in. Now we have to actually take care of our thermo aqua tuners and then fill the loop. Now we have two loops here, and luckily they're close enough here to where we'll be able to fill them both at the same time. You may be wondering why the liquid oxygen side is actually coming up over here. Since the thermo aqua tuner cooling the oxygen has a little bit more headroom, we're gonna use it to also keep the steam turbine cold. And then finally, we need to fill this area up with water. Now, normally we would do the whole trick where we make sure that we have a little bit of polluted water and then some regular water to fill these tiles. And today's no different, except we actually have a source of fresh water from our rocketry program that's gonna be used to feed the electrolyzers. And we'll be able to tap into that to make sure this is nice and full. Now, when we're filling this loop, we're gonna make sure that the thermo aqua tuner cannot turn on. And we're gonna do this by clicking below because we know the super coolant's not gonna be below minus 256 coming right out the gate, so the thermo aqua tuner should not turn on. We're setting up a little side pump area, remembering to use drywall, that way we don't dump our super coolant into the vacuum of space. And then we're gonna feed them both on at the same exact time. Once the loops are filled, we'll delete these liquid bridges, and then we'll be able to start the thermo aqua tuners. While all that's going on, this is probably a good time to start hooking up the tanks. Now, there are some considerations with this. Remember, we made this system as close to the hydrogen rocket as we could. That way we're not transferring the liquid hydrogen and the liquid oxygen too far. Now, in the normal Let's Play I have, I have actually have access to insulation. We have about 2,300 kilos worth. And to highlight the effectiveness of insulation, I wanted to show you an example. Here, I have an insulated liquid pipe made out of insulation. We go over the properties. Because it's insulated, with insulation, it has a thermal conductivity of zero, which means it will not transfer any thermal mass between the pipes and the environment around the pipes. This is really important because remember, our liquid hydrogen has to travel from here all the way over to the tanks and then back without warming up to a temperature where it would turn into a gas. If that were to happen, the pipes would end up breaking. Remember, insulated liquid pipes require 400 kilos worth of mass. Well, regular liquid pipes made out of insulation only require 100 kilos of mass, and they also have a thermal conductivity of zero. In other words, in most applications, you can get away with just using regular liquid pipes. If you don't have access to insulation, it's not a big deal. As long as your liquid hydrogen center is close enough to your rocket, you can use ceramic. 
you'll notice that this insulated liquid pipe made out of ceramic only has a thermal conductivity of 0 0.019, which is pretty good in its own right. It's not as good as insulation, but if you don't have access to it, ceramic works as well. Now, even though I have two and a half tons of insulation, it's still not enough to run all of this using insulation. Now, I could wait 40, 50, 100 more cycles and get more insulation, but let's highlight the fact that we can use ceramic. So we're going to go over to our insulated liquid pipe, select ceramic, and we'll start with our oxygen first. Here's the liquid pipe output, and here is our liquid oxidizer tank. We're going to try to go in the most direct route as possible in order to optimize the pipes as much as possible. So there's the output. And like we were saying, once the liquid oxygen comes all the way up here, we can't just have it sitting in these pipes or eventually it will turn. So that's why we bring it back. Now what this functionality does is all the liquid oxygen will continuously fill up this tank. When this tank is full, the liquid oxygen will bypass this input and head back to our liquid oxygen reservoir. Now we actually also have to make a little bit of room here because we're gonna have some other pipes going through here. So we're just gonna add a bridge. And now we're gonna do the same thing for our liquid hydrogen. Using insulated ceramic, we're gonna bring it out, up, and around using the most direct path possible and then bring it back into the liquid hydrogen reservoir. Now, if I had been using all of my noggin, I would have flipped these two around and made this the liquid hydrogen and this the liquid oxygen but it's not too big of a deal because the majority of the time the liquid hydrogen is flowing through pipes. It's in insulated liquid pipes made out of obsidian inside of insulated tiles. So there's not gonna be a whole lot of thermal transfer there either. In an effort to get this ball rolling, let's go ahead and start this up. The first thing we need to do is seal the whole thing in and then we could connect the water pipe and get these electrolyzers started. Now, chances are I have forgotten something. We'll have to break back in and go fix it, but uh, we'll deal with that when we get there. Now that some of the insulated liquid pipes are constructed, I wanted to show you something. Notice that these insulated liquid pipes are actually 45 degrees. Because we're in a vacuum, there's not gonna be a lot of opportunity for the outside environment to affect these insulated liquid pipes. But the insulated liquid pipes themselves also need to chill. Now I like to brute force it and just send enough liquid through it and eventually the pipes get cold enough and it helps insulate it even better. Both of our coolant loops are complete. We can now get rid of all of this. It is not needed. The hydrogen and oxygen producer is complete and sealed in. Now we just connect it back and let the liquid flow. Now this will take a little while to stabilize. The key is you have to have it getting rid of the oxygen and the hydrogen for a little while until you have the perfect layer of hydrogen. Once all this oxygen, carbon dioxide, and junk gets out of there though, you'll never have a problem with it. And that's one of the great things about working with this inside of a vacuum. We can just vent all the excess into space until we're ready to do something with it. And you can see we are starting to fill these rooms, but we don't want all this junk in here. Now we could technically fill in this oxygen room because it's nothing but oxygen. But we're gonna wait until there's nothing but hydrogen in this room and then we'll also seal it in. But it's gonna take a little while for this gas pump to get rid of some of these other gases. We also have our perfect two layers of liquids inside of our awesome Thermo Aqua Tuner steam bath. So now we can go ahead and seal this in as well. I ended up just using the bottle emptiers again with the water. It was actually easier since they were there from bringing the polluted water up instead of running this pipe all the way up here just to dump just a little bit of water in there. With that complete though, we can deconstruct these bottle emptiers, seal it up, and put in our steam turbines. And before we can close everything up, we also need to put some background here. Now we're gonna leave some of it exposed to space because again, we need to vent this out. I'm not sure, but I think those gas vents are a little too low. We'll find out in a second. Oh yeah, too low. And this is exactly what we're talking about with that equilibrium. You'll notice there's nothing but hydrogen on the top and nothing but oxygen on the bottom. This is perfect. We've also got our liquid reservoirs for both the oxygen and hydrogen are also completely one element, so we can block those in now too. Couple more insulated tiles to button it up and we're almost finished. Now, just because these are being used as runoffs doesn't mean that we can't actually use them for good as well. Here, I have some oxygen coming from the bottom of the base, but we don't need to do that anymore. We actually have a fresh supply right here, so we can go ahead and tie in those in as well. You can use as much of this oxygen as you can. In fact, you have to in order to keep the production of hydrogen up. You're never going to have a problem having enough oxygen 
but you will quite often want more liquid hydrogen. I just realized the first goof up on the entire setup. I have switched around the radiant liquid pipes in the insulated. This is all going to be insulated tiles, and our steam turbines are going to be up here, so it's this level that we need to keep cool. Not a big deal, we can just replace the pipes while they're sitting in place, but still. I was really hoping to bat a thousand on this project. The steam turbine room is almost complete, but far enough along to where we can actually put down the steam turbines and the insulated tiles to close this whole thing up. Now in this design I went with two steam turbines. I figured this would be a good time to explain that there are many many ways to produce liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. In fact, in one of my last Let's Plays, a series we called Primus, we used one steam turbine and one thermo aqua tuner. And that one thermo aqua tuner basically super chilled some ice. And next to the ice, we use metal tiles and doors to regulate the temperature inside these rooms. We live and we learn though. I didn't really like that design. I don't think it was optimized enough. So that's the reason why we came up with this one next. Ideally, I believe this is going to be able to produce all the liquid hydrogen that we will ever need. Now, since we're waiting for this to all get sealed up, we haven't turned on the super coolant. For that reason, you'll notice that these rooms are chock full of gas. And because of that, these standard gas vents are now overpressured. That's the reason why we have these overflow gas vents. That way this system keeps producing oxygen and keeps producing hydrogen. Otherwise, if we didn't have the overflow, say the liquid oxygen room could become overpressurized, it would stop producing, and then we wouldn't be able to produce any more liquid hydrogen even though there was plenty of capacity available in here. You could also use high pressure gas vents. I don't recommend it though. If you use a high pressure gas vent, you're going to be throwing upwards of 20 kilos of gas pressure in this room. Which means your super cool and thermo aqua tuners will have to work more because it'll be so much more gas that it is trying to liquefy. Once the 2 kilos of pressure here becomes liquid, there'll be available gas pressure here and so the vent will start pushing out more hydrogen. So all you really need is a standard gas vent. Things are going smooth. All we have to do now is connect our power spine to our steam turbines to give a little bit of the power back. Put an airflow tile here, and we might put one around here somewhere too. That way we don't have any overpressure situations like we're seeing every once in a while here. And it's because there's so much pressure in here that all of our gases are actually starting to back up in the system. And as I've said a couple of times, we definitely don't want any part of the system backing up. The great news though, the thermo aqua tuners are completely sealed in, so we can turn those on. We have the thermo aqua tuner that's chilling the hydrogen center above minus 256, and then above minus 200 for our oxygen reservoir. Now it's just a matter of waiting a couple of cycles for all this chill to keep going around, for our super coolant to get down to its target temperature, and then we'll start to see hydrogen rain and oxygen rain. Now we're starting to get liquid hydrogen already, but not so much on the liquid oxygen. And that's because, remember, it's also cooling this room. We're going to break back in here and make a couple of these radiant liquid pipes back into insulated pipes. It's cold enough in here, so even just a little bit of cooling in this room will be plenty. Especially considering all the hydrogen oxygen is overflowing through here. And it is also helping make sure that the steam turbines don't overheat. Now you will notice until you get your system completely stabilized, every once in a while, little solid hydrogen will form. And it has to do with the way the liquid pipe thermosensor works. Remember, we're saying, hey, ideally we want you at minus 256. When something comes in at minus 255, it still sends it through the thermo aqua tuner, which then means the output is a little bit colder than what it should be. Because this threshold is so small, it's just one of the things you have to deal with. You shouldn't really be seeing too much of it though, once this whole area gets filled up with liquid hydrogen. There'll be enough thermal mass in the liquid hydrogen to absorb any sort of sudden spikes and chill. Another mess up in our gas pipes. Right now we're splitting hydrogen with this vent and our overflow vent. We did the oxygen one correctly, but for some reason whiffed on this one. So we're going to break into the hydrogen side, and that's what's great about working in a vacuum. Yeah, we're going to lose a little bit of hydrogen, but not a big deal. We'll get in there, fix what we need to fix, and that'll be that. That is much better and by design now. Now, once you completely finish, it is going to take a while to stabilize. You might go through this area where you keep flashing from gas to liquid or from liquid to solid, but you have to let it run. The reason why is you have to build up enough of the liquid hydrogen to hold a couple of tiles worth 
and that way it's a lot of thermal mass so when the super coolant injects it into the liquid it's more stable than it is injecting it into the gas directly because there's only four or five kilos of gas in a tile it's very easy to flip back and forth but when you have 500 kilos of liquid hydrogen that's where that stability comes into play and that's exactly what we're looking at with the liquid oxygen side notice that we're starting to build up a good reservoir worth of liquid oxygen and the more it fills the more stable this will be that's another reason why we have the hydro sensor set on do not pump until we have at least 750 kilos because we want to make sure that we maintain a high enough level of liquid for maximum stability. Checking in on our oxygen reservoir, we can see that we're doing pretty well with liquid oxygen. There's an adjustment we need to make though. You'll notice that each tile only has 500 or 505 kilos of liquid oxygen. That's just how much it can hold in its tile. So we need to adjust the hydro sensor to reflect that. So now we'll say if it's above 450 kilos, you're allowed to pump. And as soon as we do that, the liquid pump turns on and we can see the liquid oxygen heading towards the liquid oxidizer tank. Now it's going to fill to 450 kilos, but once it does, it's going to start sending this oxygen back. Now, as forewarned, you can see the hydrogen is getting there. It just takes a lot longer. We have about 400 kilos in each tile worth of hydrogen, which is 1200 kilos worth of liquid hydrogen. So we almost have enough already to fill both large liquid fuel tanks. This is definitely a project of patience because it is going to take a while for the liquid hydrogen to get to a point where you're comfortable using it. And our liquid oxidizer tank is already full and so the oxygen passes right around and heads right back into the tank. Now there's a couple of optimizations that you could make and it's based on personal preference. Instead of a hydro sensor here, we could have put a regular signal switch here and turned on the flow of liquid oxygen whenever we wanted to. I like this method because it's sort of fire and forget and I don't have to do anything manually whenever the rocket returns. Now I'd love to finish the tutorial with a full tank of liquid hydrogen but quite frankly that's going to take a long time to happen. So at this point in the tutorial I like to go over all the overlays just so you have a perfect image in case you want to duplicate this or if you had any questions about any of the specifics. I will make sure I also put this at the front of the video for easy reference. The only thing I ask in return is you give the video a like and there's actually a reason to it. Because as you come back to the video and you only watch the first 30 seconds to a minute just to see the overlays, well YouTube's going to start thinking that you don't like the video because you stopped watching after the overlays. The like button lets YouTube know that you did like it. So without further ado, to start with, here's our plumbing setup. Remember to take note of where there's radiant liquid pipes and where there's insulated pipes. Here's our power overlay. Here's our ventilation overlay. And finally, a little bit of automation. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. And remember when you try it yourself, if it doesn't work quite right, keep tinkering, keep trying, and you'll definitely get there. I had a blast. I hope you did too. And I'll talk to you soon.